Hello, everyone. As you already know who I am, I'm Pat Hornet. I'm the CEO of the Ethics and Compliance Initiative. Welcome to our final keynote segment for the conference. And let me just also take a moment and say happy Earth Day. Um, our actual, actually our final segment is appropriately placed on Earth Day because we are going to have a series of conversations about um, among a number of topics, the proposed climate disclosure rules that have been put forward by the Securities and Exchange Commission. So I am so pleased that we have the lineup of speakers that we do this morning. And so let me just dive right into it. Um, and of course, first and foremost, I'm especially honored that we are joined by the Honorable Dan Berkovitz, who is General Counsel of the US Securities and Exchange Commission. Um, Dan actually came into his role having served more than 30 years uh, in federal government, both including um, service with the Senate and also several government agencies. And I think like most general counsels, Dan, of course, has a, a background in law, but he also came to the SEC with quite a bit of experience in the securities industry and financial markets. He served as commissioner for the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, or CFTC. Um, he was partner and co-chair of the Futures and Derivatives Practice with Wilmer Hale. Um, he also was general counsel of the CFTC for a number of years. And in that role, he was the agency's deputy representative to the Financial Stability Oversight Council. With respect to these climate disclosure rules, Dan also has quite a bit of experience just thinking about all things ESG. He served as Deputy Assistant Secretary in the Department of Energy's Office of Environmental Management. He's also an adjunct professor at Georgetown University Law School, uh, teaching derivatives, trading, and regulation. Dan, I just want to say I would be frightened of your final exam, <laughs> me personally. Um, he's also vice chair of the American Bar Association Committee on Futures and Derivatives. We're going to uh, give Dan the floor for a few minutes so that he can offer some, some opening remarks, and then I will be back to ask questions of him that hopefully all of you are posting in the chat function. So Dan, welcome and thank you for being here with us. Well, th thank you very much, Pat, for that uh, very kind introduction. Um, uh, thank you and uh, thanks to the uh, Ethics and Compliance Initiative for inviting me to speak today. It, it is a real privilege to be here with you and I appreciate this opportunity. Before I begin, I would note that the views I'm about to express are my own and do not necessarily reflect the views of the Securities and Exchange Commission, the commissioners or other members of the commission staff. Today, I'd like to discuss three interrelated subjects, the mission and function of the SEC, including a particular focus on the office in which I currently serve, the SEC's Office of General Counsel, which we call OGC, Second, the overall regulatory agenda of the commission as expressed by our chair, uh, Chair Gary Gensler. And three, the commission's recently proposed rule on the enhancement and standardization of climate related disclosures. I'm particularly grateful for the opportunity to speak at IMPACT 2022. The work that ethics and compliance professionals perform, the work that you and the audience perform is fundamental to the integrity of our financial markets. When a business or organization commits to transparency and robust corporate citizenship, it relies on ethics and compliance professionals to meet that commitment. You also have a critical role to play in support of our capital markets. You help to facilitate the disclosure of accurate material information to investors and other stakeholders. In so doing, you promote investor protection and market integrity. In a previous role in the private practice of law, Pat mentioned, I worked with many compliance personnel who were charged with ensuring compliance with financial regulations. I can say from this personal experience that, that I understand the importance of and appreciate your commitment to a culture of compliance in your companies, in your organizations, and in the wider business environment. I'd now like to provide a brief overview of the SEC's mission. The SEC is an independent federal agency headed by a five member commission. The commissioners are appointed by the president and confirmed by the Senate. 
the president designates one of the commissioners as the chair. Congress has charged the commission with a three-part mission. One, protect investors. Two, maintain fair, orderly, and efficient markets. And three, facilitate capital formation. Through this mission, the agency works to support two essential features of our public markets, trust and financial opportunity. In protecting, maintaining, and facilitating our markets, the SEC helps enable the investment activities of entrepreneurs, public companies, retail and institutional investors, and other market participants, from students saving up to college to employees preparing to retire. I've been asked to take a few minutes to provide a flavor of what I do uh, here at the SEC. The general counsel is the, is the chief legal officer of the commission and heads the office of the general counsel. We advise the commission on all legal and regulatory matters that may arise in connection with the administration of the security laws or the management of the commission staff, resources and business operations. The members of the commission often have diverse backgrounds and bring differing views to matters before the agency. After serving as general counsel of the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, which has a similar five member structure, I have found that the best way to serve multiple clients with potentially differing views is to strive to provide the best possible objective legal analysis to the commission or a commissioner regardless of their political affiliation, background, or viewpoint. The legal analysis we provide should be the same no matter who is requesting or receiving it. Presently, there are approximately 150 lawyers in the Office of General Counsel. Virtually all of these lawyers are career employees, part of the career federal civil service. The General Counsel is not part of the career federal service, is selected by the chair, and appointed with the approval of the commission. While a few general counsels have served more than one chair, traditionally, the tenure of a particular general counsel will coincide with the tenure of a particular chair. Typically, a new chair will select a new general counsel. Our office provides a variety of legal services to the commission and staff. We represent the commission in appeals of agency decisions to the federal courts, and litigate all non-enforcement matters on behalf of the agency. We assist in commission enforcement adjudications and in the commission's review of rules and other orders issued by stock exchanges, FINRA, and the Public Company Accounting Oversight Board. We provide legal advice and counseling concerning recommendations for commission action from the various divisions and offices, including rulemaking recommendations, and recommendations to bring enforcement actions, as well as other questions concerning the federal securities laws, the Administrative Procedure Act, and other laws. One of my predecessors in this job, Mr. Chester Lane, served as general counsel from 1938 to 42, and went on, he went on to defend Alger Hiss in his later career. In 1939, he gave a speech called the function of the general counsel's office and its relation to the other divisions of the commission staff. Mr. Lane's description of our office's functions in 1939 remains accurate today. Mr. Lane said, of course, we are all of the staff of an administrative agency, an agency that exists primarily for the purpose of developing and enforcing the governmental policy of regulation over finance and securities generally. In a broad sense, everybody on the staff is supposed to be contributing his bit to the formulation and development of commission policy. But as a matter of internal organization, as a matter of contrast of functions, the distinction is what I have indicated. We are not part of the commission's administrative arm. We are its counsel, its attorneys, its lawyers, in the same sense that the big New York law office with which I used to be associated was counsel to the Chase National Bank. Our most important functions are very simple to state. We advise the commission and we defend the commission. Mr. Lane's descriptions of his duties as the general counsel in 1939 also accurately portrays my job today. Quote, I don't propose to take you at all into the intricacies of exactly how we do our work. It would take pretty long to do that. And besides the best people to hear from 
about that are the people who really do it. Instead of people like me, whose job is simply to sit around and make unpleasant remarks when other people don't do the things the way I like them. We have a highly talented staff of attorneys in our office with diverse backgrounds. Many of our attorneys, many of our attorneys have spent time in private practice, either working for law firms, companies, trade associations, or various other types of entities in the financial markets. Some come to us from other federal or state agencies. Our office has subject matter experts in each of the major federal security statutes, the Securities Act of 1933, the Securities Exchange Act of 1934, the Investment Company Act of 1940, the Investment Advisors Act of 1940, the Sarbanes-Oxley Act, the Dodd-Frank Act, to name a few. Regardless of where they were previously employed, stringent financial disclosure and conflict of interest rules apply to all new and current SEC personnel to ensure the integrity of agency decisions. Similarly, post-employment restrictions also limit which matters a former SEC employee may work on after leaving the commission, depending on the nature of that person's work at the agency. The SEC requires that all new SEC employees complete ethics training and that current employees complete periodic ethics training to help ensure that they are aware of these ethics standards and regulations. It is a separate office within the SEC, however, that advises commission employees on ethics issues. The Office of Ethics Counsel advises current and former employees on matters such as conflicts of interest, financial disclosures, and post-employment restrictions. As with any other commission office, the Office of the Ethics Counsel consults with our office on issues regarding the interpretation of the relevant ethics statutes or regulations. On any given day, we deal with a wide variety of issues. There are fastballs, there are curveballs, and pitches move quickly. Often, when I begin the day expecting to face one type of issue, I face instead several others. These issues range from the First Amendment to the US Constitution to conforming commission decisions to the publication requirements of the Federal Register. In addition to regulatory issues, a non-exclusive list of the types of issues I may become involved with include budget and appropriations issues, personnel issues, procurement issues, and access to information issues. As my good friend, Mr. Chester Lane observed back in 1939, the Office of General Counsel gets, quote, every little unexpected odd job that comes in that doesn't seem to fit squarely into some neatly labeled pigeonhole. If you don't know what to do with something, send it to the general counsel. <coughs> the first general counsel of the SEC, John J. Burns, described the intellectual challenge and excitement of the position that continues today. Burns had become a full professor at Harvard Law School at age 29 and the youngest ever Massachusetts Superior Court judge at age 30. He was appointed to the position by the first chair of the SEC, Joseph Kennedy, the father of President Kennedy, and was close to future Supreme Court Justice Felix Frankfurter, one of the principal architects of the 1933 Securities Act and the 1934 Exchange Act. Burns wrote to Frankfurter in 1936, quote, the work is fascinating and the commission a most interesting and capable one. There is in this job a grand opportunity to grow in practical knowledge of the most important phase of our industrial civilization. I would now like to describe the current regulatory agenda, which includes the agency's pending rulemaking proposals and rulemaking priorities as proposed by the chair for the next 12 months. The cur current rulemaking agenda is intended to advance the agency's three-part mission and can be characterized by the following themes, disclosure, market structure, transparency, and addressing information asymmetries. And I'll give a brief description of some of these. Disclosure. The regulatory agenda includes proposed rules to require registrants to disclose certain developing and evolving risks. Examples of rules to improve disclosures include the commission's proposed rule to enhance and standardize climate-related disclosures, and the proposed rule on cybersecurity risk management, governance, and incident disclosure. Market structure. 
The regulatory agenda includes initiatives to modernize market structures and equity markets, treasury markets, and other fixed income markets. To this end, for example, the commission recently proposed rules to increase liquidity requirements for money market funds in order to protect investors in times of market stress. The commission also has proposed a rule to enhance the regulation of alternative trading systems that trade US government securities. Transparency. The regulatory agenda includes proposed rules to improve transparency for stock buybacks, short sale disclosure, security-based swaps ownership, significant stress events at large, hedge fund, at large hedge funds, and the stock loan market. Addressing information asymmetries. Another key theme is to reduce information asymmetries in the market. For example, the commission has proposed amendments to de design to reduce the ability of insiders to opportunistically trade on the basis of non-public information in ways that harm investors and undermine the integrity of the securities markets. A second example is the commission's proposed rule to provide greater transparency through the publication of certain short sale related data to investors and other market participants. In this proposal, the commission stated, quote, more information about the short sale activity and short positions of institutional investment managers may promote greater risk management among market participants and may facilitate capital formation to the extent that greater transparency bolsters confidence in the markets. The chair has also asked our staff to work on a number of projects related to cryptocurrencies or digital assets. First is getting platforms that are trading securities to become registered and regulated much like exchanges. The chair recently stated, quote, if a company builds a crypto market that protects investors and meets the gold standard of our market regulations, then customers will be more likely to have trust and confidence in the market. The chair has also asked the staff to explore whether any of the current exemptions from the exchange registration requirement for alternative trading systems could be generally available to crypto platforms. Third, the chair has asked the staff to better ensure the protection of customer assets at regulated crypto platforms. The agency staff is also looking at stable coins and tokens. I'll now turn to climate related disclosures. The commission has a longstanding interest ensuring appropriate disclosure of environmental re related risks to registrants. The agency's environmental related disclosure requirements date back 50 years to the 1970s. More recently, in 2010, in response to increasing calls for climate related disclosures by shareholders of public companies, the commission published guidance for registrants on how the commission's disclosure rules may require disclosure of the impacts of climate change matters on a registrant's business or financial condition. Last month, the commission proposed an additional set of rulemaking around climate disclosures. Chair Gensler recently set forth the rationale for this proposal. The proposal follows the agency's long tradition of disclosures, going back to the 1930s and the basic bargain between investors and companies. Companies provide full, fair, and truthful disclosures of relevant information so that investors can decide what risks to take. Additionally, investors today are already making investment and voting decisions using information about climate risk, and hundreds of companies are already disclosing them in some form. The standardization of this information would help provide investors with access to consistent, comparable, and decision use useful information. The premise of the proposed rules uh, is that it makes sense to build on what so many companies are already doing to enhance the consistency, comparability, and decision usefulness of these disclosures for investors. The proposed rule titled the Enhancement and Standardization of Climate-Related Disclosures for Investors would require registrants to disclose the following information. A, oversight, of govern oversight and governance of climate-related risks by the registrants board and management and the registrants processes 
for identifying, assessing, and managing climate-related risks, including whether such processes are integrated into the registrant's overall risk management system. E, how climate-related risks identified by the registrant have or are likely to have a material impact on its business and consolidated financial statements and how such risks are affected or are likely to affect the strategy, business model, and outlook of a registrant. C, a description of any transition plans the registrant adopted as part of its climate-related risk management strategy, including relevant metrics and targets to identify and manage such risks. D, if the registrant uses a scenario analysis in assessing the resilience of its business strategy, to climate-related risks. A description of any scenarios and characteristics being used. E, if applicable, information about any internal carbon price a registrant uses and how it is set. F, the impact of climate-related events, such as severe weather events and transition activities, online items of a registrant's consolidated financial statements, and with respect to financial estimates and assumptions used therein. G, the registrant's direct greenhouse gas, GHG emissions, scope one emissions, and indirect GHG emissions from purchased electricity and other forms of energy, which are known as scope two emissions. Both scope one and two emissions should be separately disclosed and expressed by disaggregated constituent GHGs in the aggregate in absolute terms, not including offsets, and in terms of intensity per unit of economic value or production. H, indirect emissions from upstream and downstream activities in a registrant's value chain. These are known as scope three emissions, if material, or if the registrant has set its GHG emissions target or goal, which includes scope three emissions. I, if the registrant has publicly set climate-related targets or goals, information about the scope of activities and emissions in the target, including A, the defined time horizon by which such targets are intended to be achieved, B, how the registrant intends to meet climate-related targets or goals, C, relevant data on whether the registrant is making progress towards the goal, and D, if any carbon offsets or renewable energy certificates have been used as part of the registrant's plan, certain information about those offsets or certificates. To allow registrants time and flexibility to implement the proposed rules, the rule includes a phase-in period for all registrants where the required disclosures will be needed pursuant to fiscal year 2023 to 2025 filings, depending on the registrant's filing status. For the scope three emission disclosures and intensity metric, each of the filers has an additional year to comply and smaller reporting companies are exempted from the scope three emissions requirement. For large accelerated filers and accelerated filers whose GHG disclosures would be subject to assurance, a phase in period for the assurance requirement and the level of assurance. Provides a safe harbor for liability for scope three emissions disclosure which may incentivize registrants to provide timely reporting and alleviate any potential issues of misstatements or underreporting that would occur without such safe harbors. And also there are forward-looking statement safe harbors uh, pursuant to the Private Securities Litigation Reform Act. Thus, this climate rule is intended to provide investors with decision useful information with respect to the developing area of climate risks while also allowing for registrants to have enough time to adopt these changes. For the fullest description of the rule, I urge you to read the rule proposal itself. We also have a fact sheet on our website, which also contains a summary uh, and includes much of the information I have just provided. I hope that today's discussion has provided a thorough overview of the function of OGCs and the priorities of the commission, including the climate risk disclosure rule proposal. Similar to how each of you must navigate emerging risks to support the mission of your organization, the commission will continue to be vigilant to address emerging issues in accordance with its statutory mission to protect investors, 
maintain fair, orderly, and efficient markets and facilitate capital formation. Thank you for this opportunity to speak today, and I'd be happy to engage in uh, some question and, and answer. Thank you, Dan, again, for being here with us today and really appreciate your taking time to, to just give us a, an overview of your role and also some of the chairman's priorities. And just so that our audience is aware, when we first started talking with Dan about his remarks today, one of the things that we pointed out is that many of our members through their ethics and compliance function either work closely with the general counsel's function or they report up through it. And so we thought it would be valuable to hear some of how Dan's role is scoped within the commission. And certainly we welcome anybody's questions or comments about that as well as the other topics that he's raised. So please make use of the chat function to uh, enter any questions or comments that you have for Dan. So Dan, as we are waiting for some of our audience members to give us some questions that they may have, I have some questions that I'd love to pose to you. Um, and I cannot take credit for this bad pun, but I'll use it anyway. Of course, the proposed climate disclosure rules are the hot topic, so to speak. <laughs> um, and so I just wanna ask a couple of questions of you to further drill down on some of the things that you talked about. First, you mentioned some of Chairman Gensler's priorities in terms of the rulemaking agenda for this year. And one of the things that has been discussed um, after the, these rules came out is that the, the rules don't directly regulate climate change impact by public companies. Instead, they're intended to increase transparency around climate risks, to enhance accountability for climate-related claims and goals, and you mentioned this a bit, but can you tell us more about the SEC's thinking in taking this approach? Right. Th th thanks, Pat. Th that's really fundamental um, to, to, to our mission and what we do, and, and I touched on, on it. In the, in the 1930s, when, when Congress first was considering this, this, uh, the uh, securities laws, uh, eventually the Securities Act of 1933 and the Exchange Act of 1934, at the time, there was no federal securities laws, and it was a patchwork of state laws. State law at the time, many of them were merits-based, where the states would actually pass uh, judgment on whether it was a good investment or not. Uh, and Congress, in enacting the securities laws, took a different approach and said, really, what, what we're interested here is a complete and accurate disclosure. And it's going to be up to the investors. It's going to be up to the marketplace to decide on the merits of investment. And that's really fundamental to, to, to our mission. We don't, we don't determine the merits of any particular investment, whether people should invest, invest it or, or not. But we ensure that there's full and accurate information uh, about securities so that the investors can make the decisions regarding their current investments or, 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 or potential uh, future investments. So, the climate rule is really uh, consistent with, with this disclosure. We're not a climate regulating agency. We are, we're a disclosure agency uh, for, to protect uh, investors, facilitate capital formation and, and um, maintain the market. So um, the rule is, uh, is designed uh, to, to accomplish our mission of, of full of complete disclosure. And as I talked about, uh, really uh, enhance and standardize. There's a lot of disclosure now. Uh, but the, the rule is intended to uh, enhance and standardize that disclosure. So just to follow up on that a bit, um, of course, lots of folks have written pieces to opine on the proposed rules and also to explain them to interested parties. But one of the comments that has been made is that the, the proposed rules are overreaching. Um, specifically observing that the SEC is taking on a role that really should be left to other agencies like the EPA, Department of the Interior, Department of Energy. Um, I'm interested in any thoughts you have about that, but also if public comments, we're in a public comment period, reinforce that thinking, how do you expect that the SEC is going to respond to that concern? Well, for, first, uh, I we, we propose, the, the proposed rule uh, really, is, as, as I mentioned, is designed for uh, investor protection and foster full and accurate uh, decision useful information through these disclosures. 
it's in furtherance of our mission to protect investors. Um, and, and this mandate is really different from the mandate of the EPA or the Department of Interior or Energy who have you know, maybe an environmental protection mandate or an energy um, uh, development or promotion or conservation mandate or whatever. Um, but it's the SEC that's charged with uh, protection for the protection of investors. And, and as I said, we don't determine how the investments should be made, but we ensure that investors have complete and accurate information. In, in, terms, in terms of public comments, um, we, take, we, can, we read all the public comments, uh, consider them uh, very, very uh, uh, seriously, and uh, under the Administrative Procedure Act are, re are required to respond to the public comments. So public comment consideration is a very integral and, and important part of the rulemaking process. Um, I, I like to read, I don't read all the comments, but I like to read a lot of the comments myself. Um, they're, they're not just uh, an exercise where check the box, propose, uh, read, respond. Actually, many times they're very informative and many times our rules are, are modified um, in response to uh, comments that uh, the agency believes have merit. So we will take all the public comments very seriously. You already answered one of the questions that came to mind for me is whether public comments actually make a difference in, in the final rules that actually are published. A question that's come from the audience is whether the comment period for the climate rules is longer or shorter than for other proposed rules. This one is 60 days, the questioner is asking. Uh, six, we, we've, um, the number of the rules uh, that we proposed recently have a, have a similar comment period where it's been 60 days from the date of um, publication on the, uh, on the website. Uh, or 30 days from the publication of the Federal Register, whichever mm -hmm. is later, I believe. Yep, uh, yeah. Right. So another question, how does the SEC proposal compare to EU required disclosures? I'm not an expert personally in the EU disclosures. So um, uh, the, the, uh, there is consideration in the proposal of, uh, of, I mean, staff have considered uh, um, uh, other other regimes, but uh, I, I'm not I'm not an expert in the in, personally in, in, in that in that regime. And that may be a question that we can ask again. Uh, we have a follow up conversation with a couple of folks who are have been spending probably a fair amount of time reading the proposed rules, and they may be able to comment on that. So we'll table that one for now. Um, just another question for you with respect to the proposed climate rules. The, you mentioned scope one, scope two, and scope three. Scope three disclosures are required without regard to materiality. What role has materiality traditionally played in SEC disclosure requirements? And what can you tell us about why it's different in the case of scope three disclosures? Oh, no, so, so let, 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 me clar let me clarify on, uh, on that. Uh, scope three is required to be reported only if it is material. There is a materiality standard on the scope three emissions. Okay. Um, so I just want to want to want to clarify that point. The materiality is a, is a, a general consideration. Um, you know, in in all, in all our uh, rulemaking, the standard for materiality for for the scope three disclosures is the same standard for materiality that we use um, uh, generally that was set, set forth in a couple of uh, Supreme Court cases uh, in the 1970s and 1980s. Uh, basically a matter is material if there's a substantial, substantial likelihood that a reasonable investor would consider it important, it important when determining whether to buy or sell securities or how to vote. So, we do require we do require scope three only if material and under the traditional um, established uh, material materiality okay. standard. Another question from our audience: If scope three is required for large accelerated filers, does it really give smaller companies a break since oh, since the large accelerated filers will need their information?
So the smaller companies, there, there's an exemption from the smaller smaller reported companies. They they don't they do not have to report it. So the the scope three burden would be on the large accelerated filers. Okay. So I want to change subjects um, and talk about the proposed cyber security rules that the SEC has put forward. Of course, March was a pretty busy month for the commission. And on March 9th, uh, the SEC released proposed cybersecurity rules designed to enhance and standardize public company disclosures regarding cybersecurity risk management, strategy, governance, incident reporting. Uh, among the issues addressed, the rules would require current reporting about material cybersecurity incidents and periodic reporting to provide updates about previously reported cybersecurity incidents. Can you shed some light on what led to these rules and other requirements that might strengthen transparency around these important issues? Right. Well, obvious, obviously, our, our financial uh, system, more than ever and increasingly, is just absolutely highly dependent upon our communications, the integrity of our communications and, and data networks. Um, it, it's absolutely credit, critical that a uh, the, the risks uh, to, to registrants and the risks to the system as well as to individual registrants are well understood by investors, but also that, that, um, um, that information about how these risks are man being managed um, it, it is made available. So the, the disclosure about cybersecurity risk uh, management is, is again consistent with uh, our, our overall mandate and bringing the issues that are presently facing the market into, in, into that regime. Uh, in addition to the uh, proposal um, that, that you mentioned, um, uh, there's also uh, another proposal that the uh, commission put out uh, the previous month that applies to investment advisors, regis registered investment companies, and business development companies to um, um, propose to improve their cybersecurity practices. Uh, so we're also chair, under the chair's direction, the staff is developing recommendations um, regarding cybersecurity risks from service providers. Um, these, these would include investor reporting systems, middle office service providers, index providers, custodians. Um, so, so there's that uh, initiative as well. And finally, uh, we're also at the chair's direction considering um, whether financial registrants should, um, there should be additional um, disclosure to uh, customers about cyber events, particular when their personal data may have been accessed. So that the rule, last month's rule was really one uh, in, in a broader initiative to ensure across um, the entities that, um, that we, uh, um, have, have jurisdiction over um, are appropriately uh, addressing and disclosing um, the, these risks. So you've mentioned actually a number of, of rules that have been proposed and some have observed that since the beginning of the year, the SEC has proposed more rules than, than even during the height of the Dodd-Frank implementation. And, and yet SEC hasn't finalized any of the new rulemakings yet this year. Of course, we're new into the year. Um, so kind of two questions related to that. The first is, will there be any effort to stagger rules to the finalization of rules to ensure that companies are not handling a wave of new compliance requirements all at once? Well, I, I don't have right now, I, I, I not, don't have the timeline and it's uncertain, let me put it this way, it's uncertain at this time what, what the schedule for the finalization of, of, of the rules. We consider the comments, evaluate the comments, make the recommendations. It's not always predictable um, exactly how long that process will take um, indeed. So I don't know exactly, uh, can't, can't predict or project um, exactly what the schedule for the finalization of, of the rules are. But typically the commission, as it finalizes a rule, at the time, it will consider information, implementation effectiveness schedule um, and take into account the comments we receive on, on feasibility of 
of, of complying with the requirements and, and what it would what what the timetable for that would be. So so that will uh, traditionally be is, is is considered as part of the rulemaking process and addressed in the final rule. So one question that we haven't really talked about yet is how the pandemic is affecting the way the SEC is operating, but also to our conversation right now about the volume of proposed rules. How is the SEC and the staff handling a heavy workload? How are you operating these days? Are you operating in the office from home? Um, and do, do you anticipate that the current work environment is going to in any way affect timelines between proposal and actual finalization of rules? Well, we're still we're still generally working remotely. Uh, we we have a, uh, a a target date for uh, starting to come back of June 9th, but that's not final final yet. Um, and it, it, when we do come back, the proposal would be to to start staggering. So that, that all that has to be worked out exactly what our in office and as, as I think everybody is. It's now two and a quarter years for for some of us. Some folks are in around the country, but. Um, here it's it's a number of federal agencies. It's it's over two years now. Uh, I I will say um, I, I'm just tremendously impressed though that the, the dedication, the hard work. You, you mentioned the number of rules. Um, we have a extraordinarily talented and dedicated and hardworking uh, workforce here. I mentioned the career employees. I I really wish. Um, people could come in and sit with us and and see what people do and how hard they work. It's it's not necessarily what you see, uh, the the caricature sometimes of of federal government. People working really, really hard, really stepped up to the plate. And you can see that by the volume of material um, that that, 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 um, we've uh, we've issued recently. Uh, So I'm really proud of our staff and and, um, really stepping up to the to the plate here. Um, and well, just like everybody, we, we have to address the, the work you know, issues of remote and various challenges that remote remote work faces and then the transition back to the workplace and, and how, how that will be. People haven't commuted five days a week and some of us haven't commuted five days a week <laughs> in a long time. Um, so we'll see, we'll see how it goes, but I, I've just been tremendously impressed so far with, with this mm-hmm. agency staff. And, and, and the work, uh, and the quality and quantity of work that we've been able to do. So I'd like to ask you a question about cryptocurrency. Um, thus far, banking regulators have taken a collaborative, interpretive, guidance-based approach to regulating the role of cryptocurrency in financial institutions. As we start to see products based in crypto futures and derivatives such as ETFs, um, Chair Gensler seems to be open to these types of products, but the question remains as to what regulatory guidance the SEC will be sharing with regard to determining whether a crypto-related product is crossing the line into an unregistered security. Can you provide some insight on that? Well, the chair's chair, uh, uh, the chair, the chair stated on, uh, on a number of occasions uh, made made uh, made statement that. Platforms that trade securities must be registered and comply with the securities laws. And with respect to these digital assets uh, that are securities, investors should be protected in the same way as they are uh, on traditional securities exchanges. The fundamental structure really for uh, securities uh, has been in place for decades. Um, It's needed updating from time to time to take into account the evolution of markets and development of of new products. Um, And sometimes novel products present new issues that need to be carefully evaluated uh, as to how the regulatory structure applies to them. But actually the regulatory structure itself is pretty clear. We we have the Howey test uh, for investment contracts, whether investment contract is a security um, and the Reeves test for notes. Um, so the tests, and these are longstanding tests for what's a security, the tests are there um, uh, w- whether um, something is a security or not. And if it's a security, it needs to be traded uh, on some type of uh, uh, registered uh, uh, or platform or, or something that's exempt from registration. So 
it's it's uh, I think from the from the chair's perspective, certainly anything that's security needs to be uh, registered and comply with the securities laws. So I'd like you to ask you to put on your philosopher's hat, so to speak, for just a minute. I'm curious to know you've you've actually observed this industry and observed investors, investor behavior and priorities over quite a long period of time. In your personal opinion, this is not a Dan the general counsel um, question, but has the nature of investors' interest involvement changed? Um, and the reason I ask is that in our our industry, we are certainly talking a great deal about investor influence on company priorities, but also investor engagement. I'm, I'm wondering if that is something you've observed as well and what your thought is about what that might look like going forward, given all that's going on, generational differences, social media, otherwise. Well, there's, there's, the, famous, there's the famous phrase that um, um, this time is different, right? Um, <laughs> so is this time different? Um, are we in a new era? Uh, that, that, that's is, what's, what's my crystal ball on that? You know, I, I don't know. I'm, I, I think the longer you are in the financial markets, the more humble you get <laughs> about your ability to, to predict or, or project. I don't yeah. know. It, it, one thing is definitely true. There's definite, um, I, th I believe, this is again my personal opinion, the retail interest, there's just so much more retail interest in some of these markets than previously. And the, the accessibility of retail trading, what, what people what you can do with apps and communication, um, it, it's a, maybe, maybe this is part of a, a broader trend, um, markets, you know, stocks, um, was just not some, something that everybody did you know, 50 years ago, but now people have IRAs and, and retirement and mutual funds and whatever, and it's, it's been brought, the marketplace for investment has been brought in and may, are, are we seeing a new phase um, of, of retail participation when, when the whole new trading of not just people, but classes of, classes of assets such as uh, digital assets. Um, I don't, know, I don't know where it's going, but one thing, one thing um, the, the longstanding, as, as I've been here now for six months, the mission of this agency, actually, we don't need to, we don't need to have that crystal ball, or, and it's not up to us to have the crystal ball. We, we from this agency's mission is, whatever it is, it's up to people you know, in the marketplace to decide where it's going to go, but we need to absolutely make sure wherever it goes that people, investors are protected, that there's disclosure, that it's not subject to fraud or manipulation, um, that the rules of the road are the same for everybody, and it's the marketplace to decide. So hmm. in my professional, from my professional capabilities right now, I don't have to answer that question. <laughs> That's <laughs> right. Well, we but, won't hold you to that answer right, either. Right, right, right. Well, Last question, um, just curious to know about you, the person, yours is a very stressful job, um, undoubtedly. What do you do to, to recharge? How do, you, how do you maintain your energy, your passion for the role? What do you like to do in your, in your spare time? Well, there, you know, there's two activities that I found uh, um, really help me force my mind into other activities. And one is bicycling. I took up cycling about six years ago, I go out in rural Maryland where it's, it's beautiful and less traffic and a few hours on a bike ride on a rural road. And you just got to worry about cars, <laughs> staying alive. It takes my mind off work pretty easily. And I look at the beautiful scenery. Um, and then photography, uh, photography too. To photography now with digital and digital cameras and uh, Photoshop and Lightroom uh, to try to take a picture with a digital camera and then edit it on a computer. It's a whole, it's, it's not like dropping your thing off at the film store anymore. So that, that's very, that's very, I like doing that. It's, it's very, um, it gets my attention away from work. So those are, those are my great. two things. Plus the family, of course, I spend time. Yep. The days of photo mount are over, sadly, right, I right. think. <laughs> Right. Well, Dave, thank you again. We thank so you, appreciate your joining us today. Thank you for your insights. Um, and we look forward to seeing 
the further work of the SEC. And with that, Dan is going to exit stage left and I think entering stage right are our next set of panelists. And so while they're coming on, I'm really pleased to introduce you to Alec Cook, who is a partner um, in securities enforcement and regulation and special matters and government investigations at King and Spalding, and also Mara Hodge, who is the impact e she's our ESG audit leader at KPMG US. And just very briefly, let me tell you, sing their praises for a moment. Uh, Alec is, of course, a member of King and Spalding's financial services leadership team. Um, he represents clients before the SEC, the DOJ, and other regulatory authorities. But prior to being with King and Spalding, he was a member of the SEC's Division of Enforcement, um, where he supervised investigations of all types, including matters involving regulated entities, such as broker-dealers, credit rating agencies, investment advisors, public company accounting and disclosure, and a number of other issues of that sort. I'm also very pleased to share that Alex serves as a director on the board of the Ethics and Compliance Initiative. He is actually about to don the hat of treasurer and chair of our finance committee. So thank you ahead of that, Alec. It's great to have you here. And Maura Hodge, as I mentioned, is the audit ESG audit leader at KPMG. She's a KPMG audit partner. Um, she has nearly 15 years of experience providing financial assurance services to clients. And importantly, in 2010, Mara supported the creation of KPMG's sustainability services practice in the United States, which developed the, U the U.S. firm's approach to sustainability assurance and leading some of their largest ESG engagements. So she's had a number of years of involvement in this area, has um, certainly delved deeply into the proposed climate rules that the SEC has put forth. Um, and I know you have access to both Alec and Mara's backgrounds. I, I don't want to delay starting asking, starting to ask them some questions. Um, so, so welcome, Alec and Mara. It's a pleasure to have you here. So our task for this little final segment is to delve more deeply, not only into what Dan talked about in his remarks, but also to talk more specifically about the proposed climate disclosure rules, the potential impact on uh, public companies, but also ethics and compliance professionals in particular in the jobs that they do in their organizations. So my first question for the two of you is, is what stood out for you um, with respect to Dan's comments about either the SEC priorities in general, the climate disclosure rules as he discussed them? Um, what stood out for the two of you? Alec, would you like to go first? Uh, sure, uh, and and thank you for having me, and and uh, I'm very excited to be part of this panel. So, I guess um, one thing that stood out to me from Dan's remarks, and then also just as a a follower of the SEC, is just how ambitious the rulemaking agenda is right now, and how much has been proposed, uh, you know, over recent months, and and may still be in the pipeline. Um, uh, you know, just the the climate rule alone, uh, you can tell was a very complicated undertaking that you know took a lot of work from a lot of people in the building and or figuratively in the building these days. Uh, and, you know, having worked there, you know, I know just how much goes into something that, you know, complicated and, and detailed. And that's just one of many, uh, you know, significant proposals that have made. So I think that's, that's one thing that really stands out is just the, the breadth and the uh, complexity of, of the rulemaking effort that's going on, including climate. Hmm. Mara, how about for you? Sure. So I think the one of the questions that you had asked, Pat, was just, um, you know, many people describe the proposed rules as overreach uh, from the SEC. And I cannot tell you the number of times a day that I am also hearing that from <laughs> board members, from CEOs, from, from various of our clients. And so I think his reflections on what the mandate of the SEC is and what the mission is which is really to protect, protect investors and the capital markets is really important. And I think 
as you go through the proposal and understand how the rule is laid out, what, what I would hope is that it actually becomes more clear how this rule is really, really does make sense in that context. So I think Dan had said that this is not about assessing the merits of how a company is acting and whether or not what they're doing is going to address climate change or even that you know climate change is, is a problem for their business. It is meant to require that clear disclosure so that you can have decision useful information. And so when I take a step back and look at all of the different components of the proposal that he had mentioned, I think it fits together really nicely. The goal is to say, here's how we're thinking about our risks, here's how we're managing those risks, and here's how it shows up in our financial reporting today. And to the extent that you've assessed that in the future, here's how it's, we think it's going to affect us going forward and therefore how that ties into our overall business model and strategy. So I would just encourage those who believe that it's overreach to maybe just kind of take a step back and think about really how does this go, go together and, and what that story is that, that you could actually tell around it to be value creating as opposed to just compliance driven. So Mara, this is probably a question best directed to you, but what are the greatest challenges that you see organizations facing with respect to these proposed rules? I think um, the assessment of risk um, and assessment of those time horizons and how that lines up against how we've historically thought about materiality in the financial statements. I think, you know, many of us, particularly because I'm coming from an accountant perspective and from the auditing world, materiality tends to feel like it's very quantitative driven and is the number big enough? Is, is it um, material in terms of revenues or, or profits? And what this rule is doing is really driving us back to that broader definition of materiality, which is information that would, would change um, a, a decision from you know, a reasonable user. And so, um, you know, this information that is, is kind of coming in and, and putting on that hat and looking at it through that lens, I think is, is a bit challenging for companies. Um, many companies have already started on this journey and have been reporting, but I do think that for those who haven't collected scope one and two greenhouse gas information, there's definitely some work that has to be done there. And even for those who have been collecting it, um, you know, we have seen over the past decade just some of the challenges that there are because there isn't necessarily systems or process or controls in place right now within large multinational organizations to be able to bring that data together and ultimately report it in a timely way, right? One of the biggest things we know is that most of this information is reported anywhere from three to eight months after the financial statements. And so accelerating this to be in the financial and issued with the financial information is gonna be a challenge. Yeah, yeah and I, I would jump in. I'm not as much in the trenches of this on a day-to-day -day basis as Mara is, but um, you know, I do know that you know, clients are looking at this as something that is going to take a tremendous amount of resources to get right. And, you know, in some ways they have existing controls, procedures and processes for, for other topics. Um, but I don't think it's just going to be, you know, a simple matter for them to apply those to this area, right? There's going to be a lot of, of resources that are gonna be required to, to implement these in whatever form they emerge after the comment period uh, is over. And you know, ethics and compliance folks are, are already handling a lot. You know, people in accounting functions at public companies are already handling a lot. And so this will be a significant lift on top of that. So I know a couple of audience members have submitted questions. Thank you. And I want to just remind our audience that they, we are more than happy to take your questions. So please feel free to put them in the chat. Um, I want to go back to the discussion about whether the proposed rules are overreaching. And Mara, I know you, you just addressed that. Um, Alec, I'm curious to know what your thoughts are about whether the SEC is overreaching, particularly from an enforcement perspective. Um, I mean, the SEC does have an enforcement arm. 
but is this going to start to create the situation similar to what we see in say FCPA enforcement where company is not only dealing with DOJ, but they might have EPA or a number of other agencies involved depending upon the nature of, of problems that they're facing. Are, are we likely to see that? Has, has this set of rules overreached in or potentially created that sort of a scenario from an enforcement perspective. Sorry for my really long question there. No, no problem. <laughs> um, so, so I, I think big picture, I would say the answer to that is no, in the sense that the SEC has always historically enforced disclosure related issues, right? You know, it, it, when I, was there and you know to this day you know look investigating whether companies made adequate disclosures about a particular topic it, you know as bread and butter for the SEC and you know right now there there was a task force set up last year to focus on enforcement in uh, the the ESG space um, you know looking at public company disclosures looking at private funds that claim to be ESG. Uh, you know, so th this in, in that respect, I think fits, you know, squarely within the bullseye of what the SEC has always done. I, I do think, you know, down the road, you know, once these final rules come out, um, you know, one of the challenges for the enforcement staff is going to be, you know, how do they assess whether disclosures are accurate or not? Right. And, you know, thinking back to, to when I worked there, I would not have known, you know, how to assess the accuracy of, you know, a, a level one or a level two disclosure, scope one, scope two disclosure. You know, I would need some expert in that area to help me evaluate whether what a company put in its 10K was accurate or not. And so I think, uh, you know, that's going to be a challenge down the road. Uh, and where you may run into the, the phenomenon you were just referring to, Pat, which is uh, you may have the EPA looking at, you know, whether a disclosure was accurate. You may have the DOJ and other agencies, you know, all trying to figure out whether this very specific and technical information was correct or not. And that's not something that is kind of natural to a lot of attorneys and accountants at the SEC. So sorry, that was a long answer to your, no. your question. <laughs> that's a good answer. So a question came in actually as, as Dan was finishing his comments and it was directed to him, but I'm hoping you can sort of put it into your context and, and opine and answer. There seems to be a growing corporate involvement in social initiatives. Perhaps Disney's involvement in the diversity debate in Florida is one such example. What are your, what information do you have? What are, is your perspective of um, whether the commission is expected to address the S and G components of ESG, and and what would you say to ethics and compliance practitioners about how they should be applying the concepts of climate proposals to material statements about social and governance initiatives? I might actually start on that one, Pat, and wrap in the question on the difference between the SEC and the European Union standards. So, yep. oh, thank you. <laughs> so the way that we've been looking at this is climate squarely fits into the E, cybersecurity kind of picks up the G, and we've had the human capital proposal or rule that uh, came into play for the 2020 fiscal year ends, and we've heard rumors that, um, or we expect that that will be enhanced a little bit to provide some more prescriptive guidance there and, and not be solely principles-based. But what I would say is I think about those as individual and specific topics, both the cyber and the climate proposals have been based off of the TCFD structure, the Task Force for Climate Related Financial Disclosure Structure, which requires disclosure on governance, risk management, strategy, and metrics and targets. And these proposals really just drive into those four pillars at, at a much more granular level of detail. So I think if you're looking for a way to understand how to think about other risks and other areas, those are four good pillars to use as a basis in terms of how you would structure your disclosure and, and think through them. 
more broadly from the European Union's perspective is that they are <laughs> saying two things. One is that they're not going to define as explicitly each of the areas that um, companies need to, or, or the topics that companies need to talk about and, and to contemplate. They're using the concept of double materiality. So the SEC is grounded in this idea of we're trying to share or we're requiring information that outside effects have on the business and what that financial um, impact is and what information needs to be provided there. Concept of double materiality brings in impact. So what impact the business has on the environment and society. And so it can bring in other topics that maybe a company would not contemplate as material for their own operations under SEC reporting. And it also contemplates probably more or different metrics and targets because you're, you're doing that inside outlook. So the European Union proposal right now has multiple components to it. And um, there's specifics for the financial services industry, there's specifics for corporates. There is also what's called the European Union taxonomy, which um, forces companies to highlight what activities they perform in alignment with the European Union's Green Deal. So it's much more comprehensive. It encompasses certainly climate, um, you know, social information and governance, but it's also broader. Last thing I'll say is that they have already uh, planned out 28 standards that they're planning on issuing, 15 of which there are prototypes uh, available for already. So you can just see how much more comprehensive European standards are outside of or, or beyond what the SEC is doing. And the only thing I'd add to, to that is I think, you know, part of the proposed climate rule is, you know, requiring companies to have governance processes and board oversight in place over, you know, the climate related requirements. And that governance structure is something that can also be applied potentially, you know, to S and to G when you think about ESG, right? You know, that, that uh, you know, if, if companies can implement, uh, you know, an existing structure, then that can address multiple different types of topics. It doesn't just have to be a climate-based committee. Uh, it could be, but it, it may not need to be. And I, I wonder if it's fair to assume that right now, when you look at how the world is talking investor community, the way companies are talking about ESG, it's E, big E, S and G, and the S and G part, there are certainly elements of it that have become clear in, in conversations and in company actions and company reporting, but, but it may be an area that evolves further in the SEC issues for further rules as that takes more shape. So I wanna step back and ask you a question about um, SEC rulemaking in general. We heard Dan talk a bit about the process of SEC rulemaking. And from your vantage point, if you could make a recommendation to the SEC about ways they could improve that process, what would that be? Um, I guess I would say respectfully in this instance that 60 days for something this complicated uh, might not be enough for everyone to get in, you know, their, their fullest and best comments. Um, I know there was an awful lot of comment uh, before these rules came out, you know, that was invited uh, by, by then acting chair uh, Lee, I believe. And you can see in the, the rulemaking proposal, they're, they're, those were reviewed. There are all sorts of footnotes and references to letters that people submitted. Uh, but, but now we have 500 pages, uh, you know, a very detailed, um, you know, proposed rulemaking and 60 days uh, is not a lot of time, you know, to, to, I think, you know, provide the kind of, informed and detailed comments that uh, you know, Dan said and Chair Gensler have said that the commission is looking for here. Uh, so I guess that would be my humble suggestion in this. In this <laughs> I'm gonna leave that one to the lawyers, Pat. That's not, <laughs> <it's> not <laughs> right. I just I take the rules and follow them. 
That's right. It's a, what, a 500 page set of rules. I question how quickly can you read all of that? <laughs> how quickly did you read all of that? <laughs> it's a lot of reading. I would note though that, you know, that much of those 500 pages, quite frankly, is their, their contemplation of, of why they are laying out their disclosure requirements as they are. So to your point, Alec, the comments they received from the first round um, were very much incorporated into the logic behind the disclosures that are being proposed. And so, um, you know, if you're really just looking for what the rule says, it, it takes much less time. Although I think we've done a, a preliminary count, we're at about 151 unique potential disclosures. So. <laughs> So let me let me pose a bit of a different question. So and and I'll read you a couple of statistics. But so a survey of about two thousand investors from Nerd Wallet earlier this year said that sixty nine percent of investors surveyed say that it's important for them to invest in a socially responsible way. And of that group, forty five percent said environmental impacts are most important to them, and twenty nine percent prioritize social impacts. And, and fewer, only fourteen percent said governance impacts. Does that finding surprise you? This sort of gets back to some of what I was asking Dan earlier about the nature of investors and how they're changing. But um, that said, given how important governance is, particularly to the investor community, how do you expect the, the increased value that investors will place on that? And, and what might the SEC do to help that? I think quite frankly that um, governance as a concept, right, has been around for a long time and there have been some rules that, that have come out and we've also moved to a world where um, there's there's a bit of an expectation that there is good governance in place. I mean, now that we have socks, that that is a component of it. But yet, that was something that we dealt with, you know, 15, nearly 20 years ago now. And so, I think we're. Um, I don't think governance is taking a back seat from an operational standpoint. I just think that companies feel like they have much better handle on it and that the disclosures that are being provided are, are satisfying investors' needs at this point. Whereas environment is, become, is coming to the forefront, I think because of its complexity, but also its immediate nature mm -hmm. and expectation of impact in, in the next 10 years. Mm -hmm. And I think that was really accelerated by the fact that so many companies have stood up and now made these commitments. And I remember, back in, it was probably late 2019, within KPMG, we're having an internal meeting to, to talk about what, um, what we were going to do around climate and what services we were going to offer and some of the, the detail that was provided to us and, and research that was provided were just all of the net zero commitments that had been made in the past six to 12 months by the Fortune 100. And somebody raised their hand and said, these commitments go out to 2030, 2050, 2080. Like, are they real? Are companies really going to work on this? And I think there was an understanding that that was the sentiment and there needed to be some sort of accountability built into that from, um, from an investor perspective and, and, and a, a public perception perspective. And so I think that's a bit of why we're here today on the environmental side. I think Social follows fairly quickly after that, given that there have been some commitments made there. Although I think to some extent, the measurement of that and the tracking of that is a little bit easier. There's definitely complexity and, and the devil's in the details there, but it's not as complex as trying to measure a greenhouse gas emission. Hmm. So on a related note, I wanna talk about greenwashing because certainly, Mara, you were just talking about both public companies' commitments that go far, far out, but also with respect to investors, ESG funds. Is greenwashing a problem with ESG funds? Or, I mean, how, how big of a problem is that? Or how big of a problem do you expect that to become? Well, I, I think it, it, it is a potential problem for sure. And I think you can look at what the commission has and the commission staff has said about it. Uh, you know, last year, the exams division 
you know, put out a risk alert uh, about their uh, findings from exams of funds that said they were, uh, you know, uh, doing ESG uh, investment. Uh, and, you know, made a number of findings from those exams. I think, you know, they all kind of boil down to finding that people weren't always doing what they said they were doing when it came to ESG, whether that was, did the investments match the marketing claims? Uh, were there enough compliance resources devoted to making sure that the ESG strategy was being implemented the way it was uh, disclosed? Uh, you know, were advisors voting in proxies consistent with, you know, what they said they were doing from an ESG investing standpoint. Uh, and then, you know, all those same issues were identified as uh, priorities for 2022 when the exams division put out uh, their, their annual uh, uh, report about what their priorities were going to be. So, uh, you know, that hasn't yet resulted in a lot of enforcement cases. Uh, but, you know, I think when you see that type of um, commitment of resources by the exam staff, that's going to ultimately lead to referrals to the enforcement division and maybe some cases down the road. And, mm -hmm. and you know, you certainly also see uh, you know, media reports about, you know, this, some private litigation about this. So I, I think that's an issue. And, you know, part of it is this is new and this is a hot area. Lots of investors are putting funds into ESG. And so there's a temptation to chase that. And you, you know, people that are doing that just need to make sure that, you know, they're, they've got the controls in place to, to do what they're saying they're doing. So I, I think, you know, there, I can't point to cases that have come out, you know, about greenwashing, but I think it's certainly a priority and you can expect to see some down the road where, when there's that many resources devoted. Hmm. I want to ask you both a question about what's happening within your organizations as examples of, of what's going on, both in response to these proposed rules, but the, the momentum of ESG more broadly. So with respect to these climate proposed climate disclosure rules, um, there is an attestation requirement for scope one and scope two emissions. Um, and certainly Alec, from your perspective, there also will likely be the increased um, demand for legal support in defense if problems happen, um, potential litigation. And there have been people that have observed that these rules will could potentially give rise to a whole new industry or very much bolster perhaps the compliance industry in, in the same way that Sarbanes-Oxley and Dodd-Frank gave a lot of fuel to an explosive growth to the ethics and compliance industry. So my question is, um, we know that the big four other accounting auditing firms are ramping up for uh, compliance and the attestation function, and certainly law firms are as well. What's it's happening within your own organizations. How are you looking at this? How are you thinking about what your role will be as these rules are finalized? Why you want to start? I can do that. Yeah. So maybe one one point to highlight. You're absolutely right, Pat. That there's the attestation requirement over the scope one and two greenhouse gas emissions. There is also the financial metrics that will actually sit within the financial statements themselves under Reg SX, which requires financial statement auditors to opine on that information, as well as companies to have internal control over the financial reporting, which would also get captured by our audit opinion on internal controls. So there's two components or two prongs that we are dealing with um, as, as a big four firm. Um, how are we preparing? So I've been working on this for the past two years with knowledge that even if SEC rules didn't come, I believe that there was going to be a significant increase in voluntary reporting around this information. And I think the SEC is just accelerating that. And so what we've, what, what I strongly believe, and this is coming from my background as an auditor, is that 
a majority of this information can be audited by someone who is, you know, savvy enough and knows how to perform audit procedures, but there's certainly a level of technical knowledge that needs to be um, gained and understood. And so we're working through providing that additional training to smaller groups of our professionals as time goes on. We have so many professionals, particularly um, younger people who are coming into the firm that are absolutely passionate about this, this climate related issues align with their values and they are just clamoring to be able to work on anything in, in the ESG space. And so we're bringing in those professionals, we're providing them with the explicit technical training and then teaching them how to combine that with the actual skills that they currently have. Because I think ESG more broadly just needs to become a lens through which everybody sees the world and, and is able to, to understand how they do their job. And I think that we'll get there, but it's probably five to seven years down the road. But now is the time that we need to do the education. Now is the time that we have to be learning about these things and, and how it really integrates into what we do in our day to day. So we've got smaller groups that are that are really deep and technical and working on this every day, but we really are trying to integrate um, throughout our entire audit practice as well. Yeah, and I, I think we, like probably lots of other law firms out there, you know, we'd have a different role than the, the audit firms, but, you know, we are trying to help clients get ready for whatever form these roles take. And so, you know, that involves people, you know, here at King and Spalding at least, uh, you know, from lots of different disciplines within the firm. So you have the, the public company lawyers who are experts in disclosure, you have the environmental lawyers, you have, you know, the human capital and employment lawyers, you've got, you know, people who look at it from a litigation lens, people, you know, look at it from a government investigation lens, all trying to, you know, sort of help companies assess how ready they are for whatever form this is going to take and begin to put in the governance structures that they need to, to do it, um, you know, no matter how it turns out at the end of this process. So I want to change directions a bit and pose a question that's come from the audience um, around insider trading. Insider trading enforcement seems to be picking up, particularly as M&A activity ticks up and such. Any thoughts on keeping insider trading programs within our companies robust and what enforcers are looking for in that regard? Um, so uh, this is probably a natural one for me to take first. Um, so that is always a priority for enforcement, both the SEC and the DOJ. Uh, they have very uh, advanced uh, data analytic tools uh, at the commission to look for uh, suspicious trading, particularly in advance of a discrete event like a merger uh, or you know a, an announcement of some type. Uh, and so you know the the process of investigating insider trading has gotten a lot more sophisticated than it was when I was first a staff attorney uh, at the SEC. Uh, so that, that is always going to be a priority uh, and, you know, has, has gotten increasingly sophisticated over time in terms of looking for patterns in the data uh, for, you know, people that tend to trade in advance of certain types of, of announcements or deals in a certain industry or, you know, people who may not be apparently related on their face, but, you know, you can see connections in the data. So, uh, you know, it, it's certainly a priority and it's something that, uh, you know, people need to keep up the training, uh, you know, for their folks, um, uh, you know, on a regular basis, uh, because, uh, you know, that, that's always going to be there for enforcement and the, the simplest paradigm to look for in an investigation is a company insider uh, you know, who had access to information and then someone they're connected to trades. And you want to, you know, make sure people know how to keep themselves from being involved in that sort of a situation. So regular training is, is really important, uh, you know, uh, because insider trading is always going to be a focus. 
So Mara, I have a question to direct specifically to you, and it has to do with the challenge of the evaluation criteria that are being used by rating agencies, and that's impact on investors and on companies. Um, and you may have seen last year, the Wall Street Journal did a study of um, ESG scores from three different rating agencies. And what was really fascinating is that two thirds of the companies that they evaluated um, were actually evaluated differently by different ratings agencies. And about a third of them were even labeled by one agency as a leader in ESG while another rated them as a laggard. And so this is something that has been quite a conversation when it comes to ESG, the, the problem of these rating agencies and their very different criteria. And so my question for you is whether you think that the SEC's proposed rules are going to help or hinder that problem. I mean, certainly the, the spirit of them is transparency, disclosure, and you would think ratings agencies would be looking at criteria and coming up with common, common evaluation standards. Is that going to make a difference? I, I absolutely think that it will. I think, first of all, part of the reason the ratings agencies matter so much is actually the question, the discussion that we had around greenwashing and the naming of green and sustainable funds. I mean, in some of those instances, the, the fund is just based off of whether or not you have a rating that's a B or higher or an A or higher or something like that. And if you have that disparity and discrepancy in the ratings, it, it calls into question you know, whether or not that's even the right definition to, to be uh, putting into place to make those assessments. But from what I've what I've seen and in studying some of these ratings agencies and, and their methodologies, they have very different ways of, of bringing together the information. So some of them are purely transparency and, and based off of, have you put out certain data? That's what we would expect for your industry. And so if you haven't checked the box and haven't put a number there, then you don't get any points and that significantly changes your score. But there's no evidence that that data is accurate or complete or reliable in any way or that it's been assured or, or where that information even comes from. So to some extent, you know, it's questionable, even though you've checked the box, whether or not that's that's good information to be basing it off of. Others are taking more of a risk perspective. So how are you thinking about, are, have you identified the risks for your business and are you acting on those risks and are you disclosing how you're acting on them? And, and in many of those cases, it's not even based off of publicly available information, it's based off of one-on-one -on -one conversation, which is highly um, you know, labor intensive and, and really challenging to get that information. And then in other cases, the ratings are based off of an assessment of whether or not you're doing the right thing. And so I think that's why you can have so many variations in terms of, of where that lands. So with that said, where I think the SEC proposals and the rule will bring value is first in that first situation um, and really in the second situation, it provides uh, confidence in the data that is, is being provided, as well as the frame and the requirement for a certain base set of information to be disclosed so that everyone now has the same information that they're plugging into their formulas and their algorithms to sort of spit out what that rating is. And then you know, they can make the assessment based off of their analysis of, is this the right thing to do or, or the best way to mitigate risk compared to peers, compared to you know, whoever is making that decision. But I do think that it helps to create some standardization of the inputs so that the outputs make a little bit more sense to everyone. One of the things that I've come to understand as I've talked with some ratings agencies and done more reading about all of this is that we're also evaluating ethics and compliance programs. And, and in some cases, the information they're using is based upon publicly available information and they're evaluating the quality of an ethics and compliance program based on that. And so I think too, there's as much as we're talking today about climate disclosure rules and ESG in general, there's also some room for some education of ratings agencies around what should they be looking for when it comes to the, the grading they're doing of ENC programs. 
So just a, a side comment about that. We have time for just one last question that I'd love to pose to both of you. Um, this is from what you know of these proposed rules and where we are in the ESG space. What advice would you give to ethics and compliance professionals, the folks in our audience who are within organizations that are going to be um, needing to comply with these rules once they're finalized and they're continuing to think about how they approach ESG? You wanna start, Alec? Sure, I can start and, and I'll be brief, which is I, I think the advice would be that you can't wait until the rules are final, uh, that, you know, the, the best to assume that something is going to emerge, whether it's in the exact form it's been proposed right now or not. And, you know, because so much is going to be required to implement whatever gets finalized, uh, you know, if you haven't already started thinking about how you would comply, you need to, to start thinking about it very soon uh, because it's going to be a big undertaking to do it. And I would say that, yes, there is a compliance component to this, and that is your role, but climate in, more broadly needs to be thought about across the entire organization and that we can't operate in a vacuum and in a silo just to make sure that we're checking the box and get all 151 of those disclosures. There are some really significant decisions that the organization needs to make in terms of where they want to be seen on the maturity scale in terms of how we're addressing climate. Are we taking more of a risk management approach or an opportunity approach? And you can't do that as a compliance organization on your own. You need to understand how the operational aspect of all of it works, how strategy of the company and the business model is engaged. And these are all the things that as you go through some of those disclosures, you're forced to think about. But I would just encourage you to, to not, not just operate in your own little silo and, and try to get this all pulled together, but really use this as an opportunity to see where you can drive value in your organization and um, you know, unlock, unlock new opportunities as you go forward. Well, Mara and Alec, thank you for being here and for sharing your insights. Really appreciate just that we know that you have both been thinking deeply about these things and it's really very helpful to hear your perspectives. And I also want to again thank Dan for being here as well. And I'm hoping our audience will stay with me. I have a couple of closing uh, pieces of information for all of you, but Mara and, and Alec, again, thank you so much for joining us today. And as they are exiting stage left to, or stage whatever, which direction, I'm going to share my screen because I have a couple of um, just closing thoughts and also some information to share with all of you. Um, so first and foremost, uh, I, you know, we, as I said at the very beginning of this conference, we had high hopes of this being an in-person event and it's always um, always can be a challenge for all of us to be connected and engaged in leading conversations as we're doing this virtually. And as we're coming to the close of this conference, I want to first and foremost, thank all of you for being here and thank you for your engagement in this, this event over the last couple of days. I think as I've tried to hop into most of the sessions and have heard just really tremendous conversations about issues that are very much on the forefront for all of us. And that's one of the things that at ECI, we really want to be focusing on is helping you to anticipate what's ahead for us and how can we help you be prepared. I'm also really proud that uh, among our audience, we had 27 different countries represented. Um, that's certainly, we are certainly becoming more and more of a global business community and we're happy that we are also growing in that direction as an association and as a community. Just a couple of things for you to know before we sign off for this event. Actually, even though we will close out in a couple of minutes, the conference is actually not over if you don't want it to be. Um, we have been recording the, the both the keynote sessions, the breakout sessions, haven't recorded the water cooler uh, conversations or some of the smaller groups that have gotten together, but all of that content that has been pre-recorded is available on this platform. So if there were sessions that you didn't get to attend, you can come back using the same link 
access the platform and watch those sessions. If you are a person who is looking to earn CEU credits, you can do that by actually watching the on-demand content that's in our platform. And if you have any difficulty accessing the content, getting the CEU credits, contact our office, events at ethics.org. You can contact any member of our staff and we'll be happy to help you. You can also still download and will be able to continue to download any resources from presenters, from exhibitors. You can also, and I would encourage you to visit our exhibit hall. Those booths will also be available and they're available until April, 2023. So you have plenty of time. Hopefully you will come back and, and watch a lot of these other, the sessions you didn't catch the first time because they were tremendous. One thing I do want to point out though, that is, is not going to be going on until the end of April, 2023, is the leaderboard competition and the virtual scavenger hunt that has been going on. And may I say, you have all been extremely impressive in your engagement and racking up the leaderboard points. Um, that will continue until 5 p.m. today because you can actually still earn points by going to the exhibit hall, by posting in the chat. Um, so we wanna give you ample opportunity if you wanna bolster your, your points and also complete the scavenger hunt. Um, and certainly I also wanna encourage you, there are a number of great resources available in our exhibit hall and wanna make sure that you are taking advantage of that opportunity. I wanna remind you too that we started off in the beginning of this conference talking about the fact that it's our birthday, we're 100 years old. Um, and, and so this is just the beginning for us throughout the next year, we will be engaging in centennial celebration events. If you have any interest in coming alongside us as we both plan those events, but also prepare some of the resources that I was talking about at the beginning of the conference, we would love to have you involved. Half the fun of planning a centennial or planning any milestone like this is the sheer fun of looking back over the history of the profession, the history of our organization, checking out photographs that have been taken over the years and trying to figure out who people are. Um, and so we certainly welcome your getting involved with us in that. Also, if you have been a part of our organization or the profession for quite a while, and you have either photographs or materials, reports or other things that you think would be valuable for us to share across our, our community, we would love that. So you see at the bottom of this slide, the email address for Shayla Woodson, who is our Director of Development. She is helping to coordinate this effort, um, especially the volunteer committee. Send an email to Shayla or send materials you have to her. We would, we would love to hear from you. And there are a number of ways that you can get involved if you join us as a volunteer in this effort. You see some of them listed there. Um, and so once we uh, conclude this conference, we'll be beginning to gather all of our volunteers and tackling some of these really great tasks. And I also want for you to remember to plan ahead. Um, very shortly after we close out this conference, we will be uh, finalizing the dates for Impact 2023. We plan right now for that to be an in-person conference. It will likely be in the New York, Northern New Jersey area. And that's because we do plan to have a special gala event at Ellis Island. And as I was saying in the beginning of the conference, in case you missed it, um, the beginning of one, the Ethics Resource Center, which is one of two nonprofits that comprise the ECI, we got our start in 1922, very much connected to uh, the New York public school system and also other organizations in New York area so that folks coming into America through Ellis Island and from other places could learn about American values. And also importantly, a couple of folks have pointed this out to me as the conference has gone on, the ECOA, the ECA now, Ethics and Compliance Association, this is the 30th year of its operation as well. So these are the two oldest nonprofits in our industry together, we comprise the ECI and so, we're just really honored to, and very proud that we've made it to the 100 year milestone and we're looking to a fun year of celebration with all of you. 
I also want to point out that we are having another virtual event next week. You can come back for more fun. Um, we have been fielding the Global Business Ethics Survey, as many of you know, since 1994. And every now and then we issue special reports, do specific analysis to look at targeted uh, special topics that come up. And so one of the research reports that we have have just completed is looking at the state of ethics and compliance in small, medium, small and medium enterprises and how that compares to large organizations. And I would encourage you to sign up, register to be a part of that event. If you have supply chains, if you have third party providers that are smaller organizations, this is a great way to get a sense of both what is what are the trends we see around the world when it comes to that uh, but also get some ideas of benchmarks, especially when it comes to those smaller organizations that you're working with. So you see at the bottom there of that little picture, um, you can register at ethics.org slash events. We'll also be sending out some emails to invite you and remind you of this event. Love to have you there. Following this event, perhaps even immediately following this event, because our team is pretty on top of this, uh, we will be sending you an email asking you to complete an evaluation of this conference. And it goes, it looks at things like uh, the content, the presenters, but also the platform experience. Your feedback is essential to us. We, for, based on what we learn from the evaluation forms, we think about topics for the future. We think about ways we can improve the experience. Um, and so please take a couple of minutes when you get that evaluation uh, invitation to complete that form. Do it while it's still fresh in your minds too. And then you, you, will, you, will, you will be helping us in a great way. And it's also just something that um, you can make use of to give us feedback while it's still, while you are still fresh from the experience. Before I close out, I wanna take a moment again to thank our sponsors. I pointed out in the beginning that these conferences, are, our sponsors are invaluable to us in both financially making this happen, but also they have a role in helping us plan content for some of the sessions. Um, you see their logos there. Hopefully you visited all of their booths in the exhibit hall. So again, thank you to all of them. We, we appreciate you. We're, we're really grateful for all that you do for us. And then finally, before I close out, I just want to thank a couple of other really important groups that made this event happen. Um, the first, of course, is the ECI staff. And I want to give a special shout out to Alyssa Brooks and Chris Hubbard, Florence Sumere, um, and our membership team, Dan and Tia. And there are a number of folks, Nadine, I could I should probably name our entire staff. This event has been an all hands effort, um, but certainly this is something that Alyssa and Chris in particular have worked many, many hours to put together. So thank you, ECI staff, you're amazing as always. Um, I also want to thank our speakers, both the keynote speakers and the breakout speakers. We had a tremendous lineup of speakers this year. And so we're grateful for the hours of time you put into preparation of your sessions, your engagement with us, your patience with us if we had technical difficulties. Thank you again for, for just being here and presenting to all of us. I also want to uh, give a special shout out to Adair and Hannah who work for Pathable. You may not know it, but the platform we are all gathering on is called Pathable. Each time we host an event, we are assigned some producers. Adair and Hannah were our producers this time. Just gracious and patient people. We really are, we're grateful to work with them. But also, as you experience, some of you experience difficulties logging on or challenges with audio, it was Adair and Hannah often who were helping to provide that support. So we love you, Adair and Hannah. Thank you for everything you did for us. And then finally, I just want to thank all of you. I said it at the beginning of this little segment, but you are you bring energy to these events. You are the reason we do these, these kinds of conferences, um, and it energizes and encourages us just to be a part of the conversations you have with each other. Hopefully, you met some new colleagues while you were here. 
Um, hopefully you will go away feeling like this was a, a worthwhile investment of your time. So thank you for being here and happy Earth Day to all of you. Uh, I'm in the Washington DC area. I think it's about 75 degrees and sunny outside. So hopefully if you can get an opportunity, go outside and appreciate the environment today. But thank you all again for being here. Hopefully we will see you at another upcoming event at ECI in the very near future. So best wishes and take care. Thank you again.